And so friends, uh, it is good to have you on this live Q&A time uh, as we look at esports and parents and everything in between. And so uh, first of all, uh, for those of you who are joining us, both uh, those who are joining live and those who will be seeing this uh, recorded later, we hope that this is an opportunity uh, for you to express some of your, your questions, maybe some things that you've been wondering about. Uh, whether for parents, maybe even for some youth leaders who have jumped on as well, as they are helping parents to navigate this as well. Uh, and so in a moment, I'm going to introduce Brett. Uh, actually, I'm going to let him introduce himself much more thoroughly than I can. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Alvin. I'm the Youth Ministries Associate at CBOQ, and we are glad to have you on this, uh, on this webinar with us today. And so um, Brett Chapman, who is, who's been the one who's been spearheading a lot of this stuff uh, for us, um, helping us to better understand what exactly is gaming and esports and, and all this kind of new landscape, this whole digital landscape and what it means. Uh, we're grateful, uh, Brett, that you've been able to join us and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some of your insights that, that came not just from your, uh, your conversation with Chris, but also uh, some other things that you've been learning along the way. So, Brett, welcome. Thanks, Alvin. I really appreciate this. This has just been it's kind of been a bit of a dream come true over the last several months and just really talking and sharing and, and taking the time to dissect something that, that is a little bit messy, mm -hmm. right? Let's be fair. I mean, we've, we've seen changes and transitions. So my journey in ministry, I, I've been doing this for 25 plus years. I, I got started when I was 17, 18 years old, working in my local church as a youth sponsor and just, you know, bringing kids out and doing the evangelism thing, telling my kids in high school to come. And, and moving from there, I went to Bible college and met my wife. We got married, had kids shortly, started having children shortly after that. Uh, wanted a big family. God blessed us with four kids and three dogs, which I hope that you don't hear, but there's no guarantees. I may have to quickly hit a mute button. Um, and so... My wife and I have been on this absolutely tremendous journey as, as pastors, as youth leaders, and now in the family sector. But I think for us, the reason why this is so important is because I want to talk heart to heart with the parents. Mm -hmm. I, want to, I want to touch base with the actual struggles that we're facing in the context of this digital landscape and how am I supposed to navigate something when no one is providing me a map? Mm. I don't even know what, what point A, I don't even know where I'm starting, let alone where I'm supposed to end up. And as a parent, if you're watching this and youth leaders as well, I want you to take a really deep breath. And I want you to trust that, that God has your kids' hearts. He loves them beyond measure, beyond even Alvin, the way you love your kids and I love mine. God loves them so much more. Mm -hmm. And he has their absolute purity and peace at mind. Now, when we start talking about this whole digital ideas and the, and the things that are happening in this space, I think my wife and I, as we journeyed into this, our initial struggle was, what is my kid doing? Like, if I can't be there 24-7, if I can't be over their shoulder, what are they watching? What are they doing? What are they viewing? How are they interacting in the space? And, and so we needed to shift our, our kind of parenting approach to, to better reflect trust in our kids. And so rather than taking the time, the screen time away from them, and, and then putting them in a position where they were trying to earn it, what we tried to do is, is we tried to lean into by modeling and showing the behavior that we felt was pure, the, the, the best behavior possible online. And let's, let's be honest, kids are kids. And my kids are not perfect, super duper kids, even though my wife and I have put all these steps in place. But what we do have is we have the means that we've generated a conversation. We've generated the approach that I can step into my kids' screen time at any moment. And there isn't a question. There isn't a suddenly. There isn't a closing windows and, and oh, mom and dad won't like that. And that takes time. It takes time and it takes an investment. So... I want to, I want to, I'm going to enter into my PowerPoint presentation 
it's only a few quick slides. And, and I'm really hoping that I can give you the seeds of hope, that there, there is good things here. Now, as we talked last week in the youth leaders presentation, which parents, I would also encourage you to go there because maybe you need to have a conversation with the youth leaders at your church and how they are interacting and engaging with your kid when it comes to the digital landscape. So it's a very important video to watch as well. There will be some overlap such as this. So when we talk about this digital landscape, we're talking about everything that's on the other side of a keyboard, anything and everything. So all of the social medias, all of the, the online schooling that our kids are doing, and there's problems all throughout there as well. And, and tonight we wanna use the play factor as an engagement tool to both model for our kids, to teach our kids, to guide them through this process. So let me share a little bit uh, more in the specifics here. So let's go to this one and we'll click that. And that should work. Yes. Ministry, mission, and Minecraft. What is esports? And it's not just esports that I really kind of want to focus on. I also want you to see underneath that where it says supported by STEM education. STEM education is, if you're not aware, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And they're, they have taken a huge step into the digital landscape. And they have welcomed a partnership with myself and the organization that we're trying to spearhead and get started to help families and to help churches partner together to move our kids through the educational pathway. But let's break down a little bit about kind of where we're at when we talk about digital landscape and specifically esports. So we've seen in the last decade a significant increase in the participation side. So only a few short years ago in 2018, we had 380 million players who were thought to have played the game or played games or, or participated in, in the digital space. And that was because people didn't really take notice. They weren't really counting and, and tracking that. But as a result of COVID and all of the other changes that are happening, it's estimated now that in 2019, that 2.4 billion people were playing games or participating in the digital environment. And that would include your PC, consoles, Xbox and PlayStation, Wii, Switch, the sorts, and our mobile devices, our phones. And you'll look at most kids today, they actually have a phone in their hand, which means they're participating in, in that culture as well. So as of 2021, with COVID and all of the changes of happening, where it is actually getting closer to 3 billion people. In only a year, we've gone up 600 million, which is absolutely incredible. The part, parents, that I really want you to hear, because we can sit in the worry and the fear and the uncertainty of what's present. But I think that for me, when, when, and I'll tell my son's story in just a minute, when we really began to look at how, how is the digital landscape affecting this young population? And so in 2019, they looked at the money, at the dollars coming into the digital landscape, particularly through esports at about 12.8 billion. And with COVID starting and the impact that had on households, they had to rejig their numbers. And now we're seeing a new reality of people spending significantly more time, more of their free time on screens. And they've turned the 12.8 into hundreds of billions. It's in and around $250 billion, which would include all of the social dynamics and all of the digital landscape. This rapid growth within the market is both good and bad. So when it's compared to the traditional sports, there's this twofold impact. The first being the expansions of digital devices within every home. And secondly, it's the gateway that participation is no longer tied to physical or skill ability. Now anybody and everybody can literally participate in similar activities. So we're hoping through this conversation that we're able to help you, the parent, navigate some of these turbulent times. And how can we bring the whole family in a healthy way into the digital landscape? So 
in brief, let's talk about esports, which is the wedge that we're going to be really focusing on tonight. Esports is a competitive based competition where the field, the pitch, or the court is actually a battlefield that's digitally created for players to compete over objectives, securing victories, and sorts. The competitive side requires the execution of careful planning, precise timing, and skillful execution within a team and sometimes a solo environment. And the competitive component brings a reward or a title that can come in, in, in the victory of that. Within the digital landscape, we also have streaming. And this is the participation of the general audience who similar to watching football on Sunday or baseball on Monday night, they watch uh, Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, gaming, and they'll engage with the game that they usually enjoy the most, and they'll watch that in a casual space and environment. So here's the focus that parents, I, I really want to stress, as I stressed in the beginning, is STEM education. Our main foundational goal in wanting to, to launch high school esports is to alert families to the potential careers that would exist in and through esports. You will be, you will probably be as surprised as I was when I started putting this list together in in just a, a just just a moment. So, in partnership with STEM, every participant every participant in high school esports today has an opportunity to apply for and potentially receive scholarships and bursaries to the, to the college or university of their choice. So NACE, which is the, and I don't have the information directly here, NACE is the North American um, College Association, I believe. I think that's how it works. And they just received $18 million specifically dedicated to students who choose to pursue esports as their activity. So in applying to their college, they, uh, they apply to join a team. If they make the team, they can apply back to money within these scholarships and bursaries. And there are five, currently five colleges and universities in Ontario, uh, and there's others joining NACE all across Canada, but there's five in Ontario that I'm specifically aware of. We wanna create an environment that is safe and supportive. Similar to our youth groups, we wanna provide opportunities where students can come and they can participate for social engagement or skills development, depending on, on where their aptitude might be for esports and the participation in the more competitive side. We're also looking to provide like a mentorship type role. And that's where um, we're, we're helping students that are struggling to participate in some of the other activities such as soccer or football, rugby. Maybe they're just not physically tuned to participate in these, in these high impact sports, but esports and these clubs of sorts, there, there is opportunities for everybody to get involved. And the evidence shows that participation in various clubs can increase attendance, student participation, GPA, and the overall mental well-being for students. So there is, again, we're trying to stress the idea that esports in this digital landscape doesn't have to be a dangerous, scary place. This can be an opportunity for us to partner with our young, young people and help them carve out the path that's best for them. So this is where I got a bit of a shock. When we begin to look at the various programs that the that many of the colleges are starting to adopt the the results of graduating with an esports uh, management degree or marketing degree can open up the pathways for employment to any number of and it doesn't even have to have a dedicated esports but as an example the very last one that i put on this list was legal and finance I have I am friends with with several lawyers in the Toronto area that their only job is esports, and they went they passed the bar they they went to college university they did all the right things, and now they're only focused on esports because that's what they loved as teenagers, and they're in their early to mid twenties and they're launching their careers like we don't have to limit our kids in their dreams we can actually help launch them into whatever they want and allowing the hobby and the passion of esports to really kind of take hold 
in their lives and, and encourage them to participate in this. I'll leave this slide up just for a couple of moments. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to shoot me a quick email or you can text me at the phone number. So <clears throat> as I transition away from this, let me tell you my son's story. My son comes to me at the end of grade nine and he abruptly gets in the car. It's the very last day. I'm picking him up at school. He's got his backpack full of everything from his locker and he gets in the car and he big, big sigh of relief. It's over. He says, dad, I'm not going to college or university. I'm like, oh, really? What are you going to do? He says, dad, I'm going to be a professional esports player. And I went, okay, how do I help? And we took the slow drive home and I let him talk and share his heart. and Everything was going on because, I mean, let's be fair. If I've learned one thing over all of my years working with, with teenagers and high school students, I learned very quickly, we never tell students what they can't do. We help them find the ways to accomplish what their dreams are. And so went home, went through some, some things around the house. We had to get some, some new technology. We had to bring some things in. And we got him into the fall and he was back in grade 10, it was early in September. And he had an opportunity to go and, and observe an esports group that was playing at one of the local colleges. So he went out one night and it turns out they were going to be playing the game that he has been playing and loves. So he had an opportunity to just hang out and play with those players. The coach came to me about halfway through and he says, your son is hands down the best kid in this room. And he was only 15 at the time. When I told the coach that he was very sad because his son wasn't, my son wasn't coming to the school for another couple of years. I didn't tell him that he wasn't coming. We let, we let the hope live on. But it was this amazing trans, transpiring of circumstances and situations that my wife and I chose to lean into where he was. I didn't know how good he was at the end of grade nine. I didn't know that he, he could even compete at a, at a collegiate level, let alone a pro level. And when this coach comes to me and he says that, and then my son comes out for the second night of tryouts, he was invited back. And he's playing with these kids and, and the coach comes to me and he says, have you ever considered homeschooling your kid? Have you ever considered really giving him more time to play? And I, honestly, I was, no, I haven't actually considered that at all, but we took it under advisement. I talked with my wife and there were some other extenuating circumstances that happened and it really became an option. And so in September 23rd, 2019, we pulled my son out of school out of grade 10 choosing to homeschool him and giving him more time in his screen. And he's flourished. He has done and exceeded far beyond what we could have imagined. And so my main idea here, what I want you to have as a parent, one, I don't want you to be afraid. There's lots of things that are happening in the digital space that require our investment as parents. We don't need to turn away from what's happening in the space. We actually need to lean into the space. And if you're within my age category, somewhere between 40 and 50 years old, then you know we have a unique aptitude. We actually can participate in technology, maybe not at the same level as our kids, but we know enough probably to get us into trouble. But on that note, we know enough to engage with our kids, how to find our way around. And, and that's where I'm hoping to land at the end of this conversation. Alvin, that's kind of, yeah. Uh, and it's so, a heavy intro. Wow, it was a lot. <laughs> I mean, there's definitely, I think what's helpful there is, is that it, it gives us the, the, the broadness of what this actually influences or what this could actually lean into right as, as you mentioned there at the it's and how it's rooted in in the educational pathway uh, mm -hmm. and i think sometimes uh, for those of you who maybe haven't seen uh, brett's discussion with uh, chris gwaltney um i'd encourage you to check that out because brett does talk a little bit more about that journey that he and his son and his family have had uh, in terms of competitive esports 
uh, and by the way, the rest, for those of you who are watching right now live, I encourage you, if you do have any questions, um, feel free to put that into the chat and we'll, we'll see how many we can get to. Uh, but, but definitely we encourage you to put those in and we'll, we'll try to put in as many as we can over the next few moments. Uh, although Brett, one of the things I'm curious about, because in that video, you had mentioned that when your son had made that shift, that, that esports was no longer a toy, it was now a job right? Mm -hmm. uh, something that you mentioned specifically. I, I am wondering, you know, if, if esports was, wasn't, if he wasn't pursuing competitive esports um, like a job now, if it was mm -hmm. still considered more on the toy side, how would that have impacted your parenting? Um, I think that we, we've grown as, as parents, my wife and I, and this wasn't easy by any stretch, we, we have had to push off a lot of the, the kind of the barriers and, and the reins that were holding us back as parents, but we had to trust the work that we had done in, and invested in the lives of our kids, in all of our kids. I have four kids, two that play video games and two that won't have anything to do with them, probably because of me, but that all aside, um, the, the idea of just simply being able to trust your kids and then once once that is gone, once once there's no longer that barrier, now all of a sudden we can put ourselves in in a position where we get to celebrate. We get to celebrate with our kids. And so starting in 2019 to two days ago, my son reached the highest level in the game. He's now can be observed by professional organizations because he's reached the level he's earned the he's earned that spotlight just just before we went live my other my oldest son comes down he goes dad dad you wouldn't believe what happened i did this that. and he's so excited I mean, he's 22 years old but he was like he was 10 he's so excited to share and and to draw me into that world that's my win as a dad I have the honor and the privilege of sharing this life with my kids. And, and so whether it was casual or, or, or dedicated job style esports, I, my wife and I, and sometimes I have to poke my wife to, hey, go ask this question because this is where my boys are at. But it, I don't think I would have changed much if it was casual because our, our version has always been to pursue what you want, pursue what you're absolutely in love with. And, and I don't think, even if it wasn't specifically esports, it most definitely would have been something within the digital space. And, and that's a dynamic, dynamic and fast moving river at the moment. Yeah, and I appreciate the fact that, as you were saying, this, this isn't just a, a short term conversation, right? This was something that took mm -hmm. time to build. Uh, to build that trust with with your kids and, and to and I think the other thing that that jumped out at me was it, it's it's it is celebrating where they're at right the things that are meaningful to them you're, you're mm -hmm. celebrating with them uh, and that's and that's cool to see I know that there are some parents right now especially over those last you know, these last few months almost a year, over a year, almost actually over a year now of for a lot of them seeing digital school, uh, you know, a lot of our youth ministries have been talking about how kids feel zoomed out, uh, you know, and there's some parents who, you know, who might be watching right now are saying, you know what, I just don't want my kid in front of another screen for that long anymore, mm -hmm. right, who are, who are very opposed to this idea of, of even building more screen time, or at least, mm -hmm. uh, or, or at least what that perception means. So how do you, how do you address that? Hmm. That, that is a challenging question because I think that if one, if we can change the perception of what's happening on the screen, should our kids have breaks? Absolutely. And my son, he has a YouTube channel, so he does video editing and he's recording and he's writing his, his scripts out and then he's playing games or he's watching a TV show or a movie. He's engaging with his friends, his social community through, through various social platforms. Um, and so I guess for me that it's not, they're not always doing the exact same activity. They're not absolutely tunnel focused on only one thing. They're actually engaged in multiple different activities. And, and I guess once, once my wife and I really kind of adopted that, 
we we would create moments of tasks or things that broke up that screen time. So if I needed the garbage taken out, like my kids do more work now than they've ever done in their life. So we had a food order dropped off today. I had two of them in the garage, unloading the big truck, filling the freezer. I had one putting dishes away Then I had one taking the garbage out. And I mean, there's constantly little things. And I was sitting here at my desk and I'm like, I'm sitting here at screen time and I'm having my kids do everything. And I'm sitting here enjoying screen time. I kind of feel bad as a parent, not really modeling it too well, but that's my present. And, and I, trying to find those opportunities. Meal times are great because kids are always hungry. And so I can text them and say, there's food ready. And I've got three kids in the kitchen in a heartbeat and we can have a chat. We can have a conversation or I can go up and touch base with them. Um, does that, that answer like finding natural interruptions, I think is the key mm. because that way I know that my kids don't spiral. And I also am able to monitor some of their social dynamics. And so I can see like how they, they present themselves on the internet because I'm connected to them because I have that relationship digitally with them. And so if I see something that's a little bit off, I don't message them. I walk up to their room and I knock on the door. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. And, and I just, Hey, what's going on? And I, and I pretend like I didn't see what I saw. And I'm using it as an, right? Like being, being present to that is, is the key. Being yeah. present to their relationship with technology and being able to interrupt it in healthy ways. Probably that was the fastest way I could have answered that in a, okay. a long way. And so I know there are some parents right now who might be looking at this and saying, well, it's great that you've got this relationship with the kids, right? It sounds like it's a, it's mm -hmm. a pretty healthy relationship. It, there's there's lots of trust there, right? Both, you know, not just from you to them, but from them to you, and that's mm -hmm. that's great to see. Uh, and there might be some parents right now who are just thinking, I, I just don't have that relationship with my kids. Um, and and right now, in a lot of ways, gaming is a is a wedge issue, right? It's it's mm -hmm. that. And so, what are what are some ways that you might be able to encourage some of those parents right now who are who might be feeling that? In, in very short, become a learner. Be, position yourself to learn what they are passionate about. Whether they're watching YouTube, whether they're actually playing a game. I'm not suggesting that you have to play video games with your kids because they won't play video games with their dad. So on my front, it's probably in the same boat. But... I know how to dissect content now that I never knew. 20 months ago, I had no clue about esports. So this isn't something that I've had this lifelong journey in digital ministry where I've always had a connection to it. It's only been the last 20 months. And, and I've had to take many, many hours of time and working a full-time job and then also trying to, you know, consume digital media so that I could have an intelligent conversation with my kids. So when, and let's go back a few years, I'm not sure how old many of your kids are, but um, kids were always all into Fortnite. So I would go into YouTube and I'd start, to, I'd just type Fortnite and you'd see all of these big YouTubers and I'd like, followed three or four or five of them and i just started watching them play and i would get up i'd make my coffee i'd sit down for a half an hour and i just burn through three or four different videos because they're anywhere from three minutes to an hour but pick all the three to five minute videos and you get a pretty good idea as to what's going on and then i would engage with my kids with what i saw now some of them would laugh at me they say, oh, dad, we don't watch that guy anymore. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. Who are you watching? Who's really exciting in this game for you right now? And, and there was the trick because they didn't know that I was asking them so that I could go and watch them so I could learn, so I could have better conversations with them. They, they didn't know what I was doing. Now they do. They, they've got me all figured out. But again, 
we have this ongoing dialogue about what's happening in the space that they're inhabiting. And they choose teams different than me. I have teams that I cheer for and they have teams that they cheer for. And when our two teams are against each other, we'll often get in the same room and we'll put it up on the big screen and, and we'll watch and we'll cheer for each other's team. And it's great time. So. No, that, that's interesting here because even as you say that, you know, I'm, and I think you alluded this to the, you alluded to this in the, in the esports webinar you did for youth leaders specifically about the parallels of traditional sports and and gaming and online gaming and even just the way the way you described that right i mean i know there are, there are some households let's say if they're into hockey you know the leafs and the and the canadians are playing against each other right there mm -hmm. <laughs> like you'll you'll get those you know get those nice little family conflicts happening over that right and so it sounds like you've got that similar kind of uh th those moments of of um you know, a friendly combat, I guess, is maybe the best word. I love it. I think that's a perfect analogy, Alvin. I think you've nailed it. That growing up, you're right. That's what we did. Whether it was my dad and I, I, I fell in love with the Canadian Football League. Mm -hmm. And my dad, my dad is actually one of the few fans that have been to every city in Canada that hosted a Grey Cup throughout the 1970s. There's only a small handful of them, but my dad jumped, my mom and dad, they went on the train, they went to Calgary. And I can remember them coming home from that with these little mittens that they wore on their nose. They tied around their neck. It's kind of like our mask, but they wore it on the nose. So their nose was, wasn't cold because it was an outside football game. Like those things that we, we were able to participate in as kids. And I think the, the, the digital space has kind of replaced some of those stadium type experiences. Maybe for the better, maybe for the worse, I'm not entirely sure. But my family, we've chosen to embrace those opportunities and find the means to watch them together. So, you know, as some parents are thinking, well, okay, so, you know, my, my kids involved in whatever it is, Among Us, League of Legends, whatever, whatever it is that they're involved in right now. Um, and so what are some... You had already list. You already talked about, you know, going to, through YouTube and and checking out who are some of the top people for that maybe for that particular game. What are some other, you know, I guess the cheap side of me says the inexpensive ways that uh, you know that parent can can help to build that that engagement with their kids in this. Well, first and foremost, to be truly fair, Alvin, there is no inexpensive way to do it but there's only one commodity that you can use that will buy you any anything, and that's time. The willingness to, to spend the time to enjoy what your kids are enjoying. Um, we have one family that we worked with, who they have little kids, like we're talking junior, senior kindergarten kids, and they absolutely fell in love with Thomas the Tank Engine. Do you remember Thomas? Do you remember watching that with your kids, Alvin? So there is, apparently, I've never seen it or watched it. There is this massive creative environment where people create their own stories using their own homemade Thomas the Tank Engine environments. And this mom would sit down and watch hours and hours and hours of Thomas the Tank Engine with her two boys. That is the lifetime of memories. And it was time. It wasn't knowledge. It wasn't the, the critical thinking. I mean, I've taken it to the nth degree where when I talk with my boys about the game, we're talking about the strategy. How are you peaking that corner? What are you doing with those, those tools and those abilities in your particular hero's kit? You know, I've taken it to another level, but from for the casual young person, you want to take a break, you want your kid to take a break from the game, have them introduce to you who they're watching on YouTube, have them introduce to you who is influencing their style of play. Um, one of my favorite questions, and I ask this of any student that I connect with in the game, who's your avatar and why? 
And now an avatar for parents that may not be fully aware is the, is the, is the face or the identity that you host in the digital space. Very few people have multiple avatars. Some do, and that's not necessarily a problem, but most of us have one and that we've stuck with it. I have one that I've had for 20 years. It's the same one I've had for 20 years. Um, and so learning who that is and learning, like when, when, a, when your child enters a new game or enters a game, which hero are they cho choosing? Which person are they choosing to inhabit? <clears throat> because that's that unique skill set that exists within that character's abilities will tell you as much about your kid as you probably want to know. The role that they choose to inhabit in the, in their games. Yeah, you know, as you say that, I, you know, I, I think about. <laughs> You know, I think about some of those adolescent development uh, discussions we've had with people, right? How, you know, for a lot of, uh, for, for a lot of youth, um, you know, it's, it's part of that trying to understand who they are. And, and as mm -hmm. they're, uh, you know, as they're trying to figure it out, you're right. I mean, those avatars speak to, in a sense, that ideal self or that projected self that they're looking towards um, mm -hmm. and potentially either trying to strive towards or or at least that that's what they that's are trying to emulate in a lot of ways right i think mm -hmm. that's uh yeah that, that's that's definitely a, a great way to to better understand how do they reflect on their own how do they mm -hmm. how are they building that self-awareness in, in, in themselves that way mm -hmm. another uh tool that i use now i use this particularly when i'm working with older young adults mm -hmm. so my specialty is 16 to 24 but once we hit like 2021, 20, the conversation needs to shift a little bit. Once, a, once I find young people that are in the 21, 20, 21 years old, I like to shift some of the responsibility of communication with their adult uh, counterparts is I shift the responsibility to them. So I have a young lad that I'm coaching right now. He, he wants to be a professional esports player. So we're working on that. And we're working on, on kind of how he is developing as an individual in the digital space. And so he's, he started to do some streaming and he's working really hard at that. And that's going really well. He's getting the results he's looking for, but his dad came home early from work the day before him and I met for the first time. And they got into this big, big fight. Now this young lad, he's already completed college. He has a degree. He has a job that he's working and he's just choosing to do this, this digital try to see if it'll work for him. And he's doing it part-time and in the evenings and such. So he's not sacrificing anything that a, that a traditional parent might want, but him and his dad get into this big fight. And he says, dad, you just don't understand me. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. But have you taught your dad who you are? And so I challenged him. I said, you know, what does your dad love to do? He says, oh, my dad loves to take his Porsche out for a drive every, every Sunday morning. I'm like, okay, you like coffee? He goes, oh, I love coffee. I live on coffee. I'm like, perfect. Why don't you ask your dad to take you to the coffee shop on Sunday morning? Go and spend 25 minutes with, in the car with him. So when I want parents to engage with that 16 to 19 year old, I'm asking you to flip that switch back find what your student or your child is, is strongly passionate about and how can you engage for 15, 20 minutes, a half an hour, start it just a week. Don't try to invade their space, but try to engage in their space. Try to learn why they're passionate about that. And so those are the kind of the two scales that I like to tip back and forth when it comes to students and parent relationship something that you mentioned there is, is that, uh, you know, you're involved with coaching some people, you know, I, I'm wondering if there are some parents, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, if they want their kids to learn a musical instrument or if they want them mm -hmm. to learn, uh, you know, go to a basketball camp, that kind of stuff. Uh, where are some of those, um, or at least either networks or, or like, how do you even hire an esports coach in the first place? Like that kind of stuff. Where do you, where do you find tutors or, Mm -hmm. or other help for your kids if they're interested in pursuing this area? 
there's some pretty formal opportunities throughout um, various. Now we like to to again using STEM as our platform. We want to we want to to use the school system to provide these opportunities. That's our end goal right now. We're trying to engage the school board and the, the province of Ontario um, to, to allow esports to be more consistently present. So step one doesn't actually exist, but that's what we're trying to focus on right now. Um, if, your kid, if, your young ch if your kids, children, youth are involved in a game that they're playing consistently, all they really need to go is go to YouTube to find coaching. Now that's a non-relational coaching. They're just gonna give you skill sets, tips and tricks, jump spots, that sort of stuff. And they can then watch the video and then go try it on their own. So there's step number two. Step number three is most kids that are still progressing down this path, uh, the Discord communities that they are a part of, which is one of the social media platforms, they have spaces where coaching is available. So my youngest son, he found a Discord that had free coaching. Coaching can cost anywhere from 50 to $400 an hour, depending on the rank and the skill set of the player that, that you're asking to coach you. Um, but my son found a free one and he was able to get some of the tips and tricks he needed to take this, the next logical step in his pathing. And he's now you know, achieved what he wanted to achieve the whole time, which is grandmaster. No, those are, it, it's, uh, it's good to have some of those resources available and, and to be able to find some of that. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, there was one question that actually came up. Actually, this, this question came um, did, when, when we did the, the premiere of the, um, the eSports parent webinar between you and Chris. I'm just going to read it out here. Uh, the question that they that was submitted was this um, are you concerned about the dangers of gaming for parents who are not morally or ethically intelligent or rather technologically savvy like yourself to monitor their children i'm not sure that's a mouthful for you short answer is no hmm. and there's a lot of deep theological ties in that one that this probably isn't the, the appropriate time or space to break everything down. As I said on the beginning, I truly believe that God loves our kids immensely more than we do. And, and, and yet, simultaneously, our kids do model the life that we are presenting. And so if you do have a parent that is not morally or ethically in line, then it's likely that that student or child may struggle in developing those. What, what often happens though, as welcoming as the digital landscape is, it's not very forgiving, okay? So let me explain. It's very broad, very wide. Everybody can find a home. But once you're in the camp that you're kind of fitting into, there's not a lot of forgiveness if you break the rules that are present. And almost every single one of the discords that I've joined has a code of conduct. You have to behave in a certain way. You can't talk about these topics. You are allowed to talk about these topics. If you do talk about this, you're out. And, and so I was in a group just the other day and the admin jumped into a voice chat and he says, if I hear anything such as blank, 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 you're gone. There's no, there's no warning. There's no second chance. You're just gone. I'm just, we're not tolerating it. Um, and so there are great, great leaders out in the space and, and there are people such as myself, and even you, Alvin, that we are rising. We are coming to a greater sense of the knowledge of what the space has and what the space needs. And, and so I'm still building relationships. I'm still networking with lots of really cool people. Um, one of the people I'm hoping to connect with uh, coming up is the senior pastor for uh, an organization known as Game Church. And that was a church that's digitally planted for the sole purposes of ministering to gamers. And similar to biker church, right? Where if you don't ride a motorcycle, you can't come to church. Oh my goodness, that sounds so, yeah, you're right, it does. <laughs> but like-minded people can, can minister to like-minded people. And, and I think that is this space. Now, 
although computer and networking and all this sort of stuff has been around forever, the digital landscape is still very young. YouTube launched in 2006. And you go back and watch some of those videos. There's pretty terrible stuff out there uh, from a con like from a, just a technical perspective, what people are capable of doing. And now you've got people posting stuff on TikTok that's in 4K. You're like, holy cow, they're doing great. They're put right. So there's been an evolution, but that evolution is still growing, it's still evolving. And I mean, realistically, social media in and of itself is what 16 years old, maybe. 14 or 15 years old as a whole and teenage years are hard but getting through that and moving into that adulthood or that young adulthood that's where things really kind of come into their own and we're seeing that in the digital space we're seeing maturity happen not everywhere but in some of the circles i walk i'm seeing quite a bit of evolution and it's been really really interesting to watch I'm just going to take just a bit of a left turn here uh, just for a moment. Uh, there might be some, some of our parents who, whether it's through, um, you know, through headlines or other things that catch their eye, maybe they've heard of this whole thing called, uh, you know, gaming disorder. And they see that, you know, the World Health Organization has something about it. Can you just take a moment just to address, uh, at least, you know, for parents who might, who may not necessarily have delved deeply into that, they hear this and they're like, well, what do I do with this now? Like, is this what my kid's into? Uh, like, how would you address that? Well, I think first and foremost, going right to the source of the document. And so the World Health Organization defines gaming disorder as this. Um, they, they have recently created a revision to the international classification of diseases, adding gamer disorder, which is a pattern of gaming behavior, digital or video, which I don't know why they're to differentiating because they're the same thing. So it's characterized by an impairment control over gaming, increased priority given to gaming over other activities to the extent that gaming takes precedent over other interests and daily activities and a continuation or escalating escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences. That in and of itself is, is very, very true. I deal with those negative consequences on a daily basis, working, trying to work in a team-based environment when only two people want to actually do the objectives together. The other three want to go over and do their own thing. And the word slinging happens and people are upset at each other and it's re referred to as flaming or, or just general toxicity in the space. That is going to be one of the predominant experiences for our kids. So how can we avoid that? Well, we can't avoid the toxic environment. How can we help our kids heal to then quickly come back to it? Because I think that learning how to, eat, to be evolved and mature in a toxic space is important. Um, and so let's continue reading. For gaming disorder to be diagnosed, the behavior pattern must be of sufficient severity to result in significant impairment in personal, family, social, education, occupational, or other areas of functioning that would normally have been evident for at least 12 months. So there is a large calendar time span, and, and then there, the, the, the impact is in several different areas. So I have my youngest who's enjoying the journey that he's on. And I would say he's probably spending between 10 and 12 hours a day on screen. Now, he's not engaged in the same game all the time. I think I kind of went through this a little bit earlier that he breaks up his activities and in amidst of those activities, he gets time where I pull him away to take the dog for a walk, to mow the lawn, to take the garbage out. And I'll just randomly sprinkle those things in and throughout. But because of the relationship that we have and my willingness to wait, there's that trust that is built. My, my oldest son on Sunday, I said, hey, can you take care of your chore? Oh, absolutely, dad. I'm all over it. Okay. Didn't do it. 
And so then he, I was out early Monday morning and I came home and he caught me in the hallway and he says, dad, I'm just waiting for your, my brother to wake up and then I'm going to do my chore. I'm like, it's okay. I know it was going to get done. He goes, yeah, but I wanted you to know because I didn't do it when you told me to do it. I'm like, it's okay. I asked you to do it. I know it'll get done. And I know it'll get done. Because if it doesn't get done, your mother's going to kill you. No. Um, but <laughs> the, the idea that we've just, I, I have allowed myself to have patience. I, I used to play a game. Actually, no, I won't tell that story right now. I love games that are like 10, 15 minute rounds. Really, really quick succession. And like jump rope, you as a parent, you may have to learn how the rhythm works for your child in the game that they're playing. There are always breaks. There are always moments where you can pull them out real quick, have them a chat. If you hear them raising their voice, go and sit beside them. They'll be totally embarrassed and everything else, right? But grow that, learn have them tell you, hey, I noticed you were you were a little upset in the last game. What happened? Oh, so and so. No, no, no. What happened? What happened that made you upset? Not what somebody said. How did the game devolve? Like how what happened in your experience that caused the emotional outburst? Um, and if and I can go into a lot more of the unique strategies that we used as parents if we wanted to have another follow up call. We could do something really quick. And I could actually go through all the tools. I grounded my son, one of my sons from one of their games. I said, you can't play that game for four months. Took it away from him. And it was real. It was serious. And, and then not only did I do that, but then I forced him to play games with me because he had to learn. He had to learn how to engage in the space in a healthy way. And, and sometimes, yeah, you do need to be a little bit more there, but we can go into that if there if there's an appropriate request or something along those lines, I guess. Yeah, definitely. I'd encourage uh, whether it's parents or even churches that might uh, be willing to take you up on that, right? And just to mm-hmm. even have you specifically walk through with their context and and maybe some different, uh, you know, your different insights and in how they can navigate some of that. You know, we've got a few more minutes left here, and a couple of a couple. One question that jumps to mind is. You know, for a lot of parents, they're thinking, <laughs> like many things, it's just, it's almost like an overwhelmingness, right? Especially if they're not used to this. Uh, what are what are some reasonable expectations that they that they might be able to lean into their church family for in all of this? Mm, that's a tough question, Alvin. I, that one's kind of come out of the blue on me there. Um, I I don't have an answer to that one. To be fair. Because I think that there's there's a there's a bunch of different factors, right? Is is the church present to the digital space? I mean, there's a lot of churches that are still struggling to survive because they didn't have a digital approach, and COVID has forced them into that. And I mean, I was talking with one church, and you know, they were uh, uh, on a Sunday morning, they were getting 250 people out. They can't get 25 people to come to a digital recording. Like their whole church decimated. But I think that that there there are people like yourself, right? Like I would I would encourage people to connect with you first, not first. Would just encourage people to connect with the various levels of leadership and and seek out what opportunities exist to have other conversations. Um, in a lot of cases, it's you, the parent, and let me let me talk right to the parents for this moment. It's going to take your call to the church to get the church to start something. You know, sometimes it's just not on the church's radar because they don't see it. They don't see the need. But if you as a parent are passionate and are concerned for this space and your kids and their inhabiting of it, call your church and say, hey, we really, really like to see something. How do we do this in a healthy way? And, And ask the church to help find resources or look for resources. No, I think that's that's helpful, right? It's the parent who reaches out to the rest of the community asking, can you help me with this? I think obviously, I think there's the, without tipping to the balance of, can you do this for me, right? I think 
And yeah. I think that's something that you've been leaning into a lot in the last few moments is, is that, you know, as the parent, this is one of the key things that you're going to need to help your kids navigate through. Um, you yeah. know, I think, I think one of the things that you alluded to is the fact that, you know, what they're, although what they're playing may be digital in some ways, you know, whether you want to consider it fictional, but, but the interactions are real, right? Their responses yeah. are real. Like they're, yeah. it's, it's part of, it's, it's, it's reality. It's not just some, uh, you know, some make-believe side of, of life, right? This is, mm -hmm. this all is integrated as part of the reality. And they, and that's part of our roles as parents is to help them navigate through that. Absolutely. And, and even as parents, be assured you're not alone. Mm. We're all battling through. We're all trying to figure it out. Some of us, I mean, my kid, my youngest is 17 years. So I might be further along than the parent who's got a 13 year old who is a Fortnite crazy person with building and doing all the things that they need to do. Right. Like there, there's, we're all at different phases and stages. And mm -hmm. so I think one of the things that this digital ex experience through COVID and everything else, one of two things has happened. We've either become too insular or we're, we're starting to kind of reach out of our, our homes and our spaces and try to say, hey, how can I do this in a healthy way? Uh, and I hope it's the latter. I hope that we're learning to, to reach out and connect and find uh, and ask questions because that's going to be the solution is, is not necessarily the answer. That's, that, that will all come in its due time, but learning how to ask the right questions. That's that's going to be probably the most important component. So, I think you just answered the last question I was going to ask. I was going to ask what's <laughs> what's that what's that kind of final word of advice. But I think you're right there. Yeah. And it's you know one of the things that you mentioned earlier is is taking that learner's posture, right? And and I think sometimes we as parents we feel that pressure. We feel that pressure that I've got to know it all somehow, mm -hmm. right? I've got to have all the answers, and yet you know uh, letting your kids teach you. I think it's it's both uh, a humble by but I think what you even mentioned before, it's, it helps to build that trust. If you're willing mm -hmm. to trust what your kids are telling you about what they're learning and what they're understanding and how they're viewing things. Mm -hmm. That's, and that's just it. That's just it. We're not alone and lean in. And, and maybe <laughs> it's funny. I, um, I think about the, the idea of the cell phone and I can remember being in grade 10 and going in to write my math exam and asking my teacher if I could bring a calculator. They're like, no, you cannot bring a calculator. You will not have a calculator with you every day of your life. You're going to need to learn how to do this on your own. Oops. I have a calculator with me everywhere I go. And, and, I, and I say that in a bit of a humoristic way, but I think that our kids know they have access to all of the knowledge, okay? So never assume your kid doesn't know because they probably do know. What they're lacking is the wisdom to make the healthy choice. So there is still a space for the parent within life, within the family, even if your kid does know everything, which is very possible. At least they believe they do. They still need your wisdom and your compassion. And that's the best way to lead our families, in my opinion. No, and I think that's a, that's a great way for us to close off uh, our hour together. And so, Brett, thank you very much. Uh, I thank you both for um, your your willingness to to help us to see, you know, both some of the, your your own growing pains, but also uh, the ways that's helped shape not just your approach with esports but also just uh, how, it's, how it's impacted your relationship with your kids. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that, that you've brought it over and over again is the fact that, uh, you know, these are not, you know, it, this is not just about gaming, right? This, this is really at yeah. the end of the day, um, part of our overall parenting and, and how do we approach it. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, Brett, for your, for your time. Uh, thank you for uh, this time you spent, not, not just uh, for the last hour, but also in creating the resources alongside us. And so for the rest of you, I encourage you, 
if you're if you're watching this on on YouTube right now in the links below you'll you'll get uh, Brett's contact information you can always reach him out through there and also there's other ways that we as the as the CBOQ can be supporting uh, not just parents but also youth uh, youth ministries and churches as you're trying to navigate this too um, this is a as Brett was mentioning earlier this is this is in a sense the new frontier right this is a a, a space that not many youth ministries know how to step in well and we're all still learning but this is an opportunity that perhaps that we can actually step in well as our kids are already <laughs> jumping into this this space well ahead of us but to, to be able to be there with them as they as we all navigate this so thank you very much brett for your time and for the rest of you uh, we blessings as you continue to to seek and understand um, what does it mean to serve in this landscape with our kids thanks again alvin it's been amazing